Okay, so what, uh, as he indicated, what's going to happen here, I'm going to, I'm going to give, a, I hope, a short talk to sort of get everybody on the same page, and then we'll go and, and see the demonstration uh, in the museum. Maybe split into two groups, and uh, the group that's not watching at that moment can look at some of the other stuff in the museum. We have a lot of new stuff. Okay, so this is going to be a talk about this, the Stroger telephone switch, which was the machine uh, invented in the uh, 1890s to replace the telephone operator. It's a completely mechanical uh, digital computer, in effect, and we have a working model uh, in, in our museum. So to sort of warm things up, let's talk about what's in actually a basic telephone. I have here showing both ends of the phone, and, and the telephone loop is a very simple thing. Uh, it's a single loop here uh, with a DC power supply that puts a current through the loop. When you speak in over here, you have a container with carbon granules, really chopped up fine carbon uh, like charcoal, and uh, that's, they're slightly conductive. Uh, when the sound wave squeezes the carbon grains, the conductivity uh, increases and you get more current. And that turns the DC current into a voice current that you can hear uh, with a, a receiver, right? As this current varies, the magnetism here changes and it moves the diaphragm back and forth. So, uh, very simple idea, but let's look at some of the, the, the features here that come out right away. Uh, first of all, this is a loop that has no amplifier in it. Uh, no electronics whatsoever. There's so much output from the carbon microphone that you can drive a telephone call 20, 30, or 40 miles without any amplification at all. Now that was a big deal because after all, this was used before electronics was invented by and large. So you, it had to work that way. Uh, another thing is that uh, the telephone even today has no volume control. This is probably the only audio device that has no volume control knob on it. And uh, I'm going to get to how that actually gets pulled off. Another thing you might notice uh, is that this battery is simply in that series loop. So you can put these batteries any place you want. And that's important because I can put the battery back at the telephone central office and have no local power supply at the telephone. And in fact, for many years, that was a major feature of the home telephone. You didn't have to plug it in and it operated independently of the power company. Uh, now, another thing that you would notice here uh, is that DC current also flows through this coil even when, it, when it's not doing anything. And, and that's really not something that we would like to have. It would be nice to just have voice current in here. Uh, so we're gonna have to find a solution to that. Uh, another thing that you'll notice is that when this guy talks in here, his sound appears over here in this receiver, and an equal sound comes out of here. In other words, he hears his own voice in, the, in his own telephone. In the phone business, this is called side tone. And side tone is generally not something that we want. Uh, we shout in, we talk into the phone, it comes back into our ear, it's not really what we want. We want to really hear the guy at the other end. So one of the first things we want to try to fix uh, is the side tone problem. And that's done by a network in the telephone, which is a, a, a transformer circuit. And it's actually uh, relatively simple uh, if, you, if you draw it out by eliminating most of the parts that are really in there. So what we have here, first of all, is a transformer. This is the transformer that's going to ha handle the audio signal. And now we're gonna connect the receiver to the output of this transformer. So first of all, we've solved the DC current problem because now no DC goes in, into the receiver. But look at how we've got the transmitter connected. This is the carbon transmitter and it's gonna generate voice current out this way. And we're gonna put the voice current into the center tap of this transformer. So when the voice current goes in over here, it's going to go equally in this direction and that direction. Equally if the impedance or the resistance of the telephone line over here is equal to a local resistance over here. So if I drive voice current into the center tap and it goes in both directions equally, I generate an equal and opposite magnetic field from this coil and none of this sound can get out to the local receiver. So I've actually accomplished uh, the idea of eliminating the side tone. 
And this thing works, can work perfectly if the currents are equal and opposite in these two coils. And they'll be equal and opposite if the resistance of the line or the impedance of the line is the same as this resistance over here. Now normally, uh, you don't quite get it right. If you wanted to do this perfectly, what you would actually do over here is you would build a simulation of the entire transmission line, and then you would have balance. But it turns out that you don't actually want to eliminate all of the side tone. You want a little bit, a little bit of it to, to remain there. Because when you pick up a telephone, you would like to feel that it's live. And when you talk into it, a little bit of that sound coming back uh, makes you feel that the telephone is active, not dead. Now, well, I mentioned before that there's no volume control in the telephone, but it turns out there actually really is an automatic volume control. Because you see, with side tone, if I talk too loud, I get a big side tone and I'll talk down. And if I get a small, side, a small amount of side tone, I'll talk louder. So I trick the customer into automatically adjusting his voice to give roughly the right level on the line. Now my contention is that the people who have designed cell phones didn't understand this. And that's why you find people shouting into cell phones. If the cell phone had a good side tone system, it would stabilize the voice and we'd be better off. Okay, so what does one of these little networks look like? The network in, in a home phone looks something like this. It's got that coil in it. It's got some resistance and some other elements to balance the line and a handful of other random parts that you need to make the telephone work. And every telephone will have one of, one of these, something like this, this in there. Okay, so we're going to talk about the ringer. Uh, the bell in the telephone and telephone parlance is called the ringer. And this is not your ordinary home doorbell with a set of vibrating contacts. The, the ringer in the telephone is an actual synchronous motor that's powered by 20 hertz sent out from the uh, central office. 20 hertz at somewhere between 90 and 130 volts uh, in order to power this little motor. Yes, uh, you can get a, get a shock from the voltages that are sent out. So the, uh, the, the ringer consists of this vibrating armature, which is biased by a permanent magnet. It's got a big coil around it, uh, and uh, that's the coil that powers the armature. And there's also a series capacitor there, so that if we take the ringer and connect it directly across the telephone line, uh, no DC current will flow through it. And what's more, the inductance in these coils is high enough so that uh, no audio will go through it. And that means that we can actually take the ringer and connect it directly across the telephone wires uh, uh, without any switching at all. So what, on, on a normal telephone, the ringer is, is permanently hanging right across the line. Uh, it also means uh, that you can connect the, an independent ringer anywhere you want in your house and just connect it right on to the telephone lines. Now, in the phone business, uh, the two wires are still called tip and ring, and that harks back to when we had wires like this, plug-in cables. And, of course, these cables had... Uh, three connectors, the tip, the ring, and the sleeve. And uh, uh, that third wire, that sleeve wire, is very important, and we're going to uh, get back to it a little later on. So let's take a, a quick look at what a whole telephone looks like now. We have this ringer connected directly across tip and ring, and then we have uh, a contact, uh, which is on the switch hook, so that when we hang up the telephone, this switch hook contact opens and no DC current flows into the telephone. So the telephone is completely uh, dead as far as DC is concerned. Uh, later on, we're going to see there's another interrupting contact, uh, which is, so, is associated with the dial. But uh, one of the interesting features about the switch hook contact that opens the DC is that when you hang up the phone, it's truly dead. It's not like... Uh, your cell phone where uh, uh, ending the call is under software control and somebody could actually defeat it. You have true security when you hang up a telephone because there's no current at all being uh, supplied uh, to the microphone. So uh, continuing on to what's in this in the telephone set, uh, uh, we have of course the, the network, the hybrid that we talked about before, the switch contacts, and on the other end, we have to power the telephone. And the way I show it here is battery, 
Uh, that's 48 volts DC. We call it battery in the phone plant. Uh, being applied through a set of coils, which is probably the coils of some relay, so the battery is isolated from voice current. Now, in order to, uh, to make a call, we're going to want to send pulses, uh, DC pulses on this wire pair. So we have a dot that's going to open and close the telephone circuit, right? And here's a telephone dial. And when I uh, dial a number, I dial a six, I'm going to get six pulses. I'm going to get six very accurate pulses because in, in the back of the dial is an actual centrifugal governor that's going to give me very accurately about 10 pulses a second rate, about half on and half off, okay? Now, uh, so this is, of course, digital transmission, and it's even simpler than binary transmission. You normally think it's a sim the simplest digital system is binary. This is actually unary. Now, most people have never heard of unary. And unary means if I dial A, I just get eight pulses. Not two to, not two to the third, but just eight. So it's unary. Yeah. Incidentally, here's, a, here's an actual bell if you want to look at it. And you can see the permanent magnet in there that makes this into a motor. And uh, well, so it rings. Okay. I think I have managed to lose my device. All right, a few more things while we're on this picture. Uh, one of the things you can do with a simple telephone, or simple, pardon? Microphone, okay. Back in C, thank you. One of the things you can do with a simple telephone is simply connect another telephone in parallel right over here. Of course, that was the extension telephone. And it's remarkable that just connecting another telephone in parallel makes everything work. I have on this telephone full duplex uh, with anti side tone. The, the extension telephone uh, connects together just like a conference circuit. Uh, everything works. I, can, I, can, I can't dial both at the same time, but I can dial one uh, at a time. Now, one, uh, one variant of the extension telephone is the old fashioned party line. Instead of having an extension telephone in my house, basically there's one in somebody else's house. And so uh, when I talk, you can listen and pick up the phone. Now, one of the things that would be undesirable in a party line is when you ring the phone, you don't want everybody's phone to ring at once. So one of the tricks to do uh, selective ringing with party lines is to not connect the ringer from tip to ring, but to connect the ringer from tip to ground on one phone and from ring to ground on the other guy's phone. So depending on which voltage is put out at the central office, you can ring one phone or the other. And then of course, any, everybody can talk. There's actually a way to do selective ringing with four and eight parties, but that's it's way too complicated. Okay, so what are we gonna show uh, in the museum? We're going to show telephone switch that replaced the telephone operator. So what we have to do is basically uh, connect your telephone to the outgoing telephone. Now you have to imagine a telephone central office that has a pair of wires going out to every customer. A standard central office would have about 10,000 lines. So I have 10,000 wires coming into the basement of that building twisted wire pairs. All of those wire pairs have to be hand soldered onto a switch like this, plus a lot of them in parallel. So if, you know, if you're inter interested in hand soldering, this is the job for you, because we're talking about hundreds of thousands of wires. Uh, because these wire pairs, I mean, each telephone has, has a wire pair, right? Let me, say some, let me say a few things about why there's even a wire pair here. You know, in the old days of telegraph, we had a single wire with a ground return. And in fact, that's the way the one works in the museum. They tried to do that at the beginning of telephony, but they found out that there was too much crosstalk. Crosstalk because when you send the current down a wire, it generates a magnetic field along the wire. And if I have another wire going next to it, 
that magnetic field will induce a current in the other wire, and some of the signal will move across. So in the uh, uh, wire that's being offended by the signal, you have background noise, which is undesirable, cross-talk. But the worst kind of cross-talk of all is intelligible cross-talk, where you think you can hear or can actually hear someone else's conversation. In the phone business, this is terrible. So one of the very first modifications of the wire plant in the phone company was to, was to connect all telephones with pairs of wires. So now if I have the same current going out and coming back, the magnetic fields balance and it reduces the crosstalk. Now to make the crosstalk even less, uh, because there might be some systematic variation, I twist the wires so that uh, if there's an un still an unbalance, the twisting tends to make it cancel out. Now if I have a bunch of cables, wire, wire pairs twisted in a bundle, and they all have the twist rate the same, maybe the effect of the twisting will, can't, will be negative. So if you look into a telephone bundle, cable, you'll find that every twisted pair of wire has a different twist rate. And the, the configuration of how to do the twisting is kind of a cottage industry that a few guys figured out how to do to absolutely minimize all the crosstalk. Okay, so now we want to connect these things together in a switch. And this basic switch uh, is like a uh, 100 precision, 100 precision double throw switch. What we're going to do here is we have 10 levels of connectors, and on each level there are 10 sets of contacts. And each of these contacts is a double contact, so that a pair of wires connects to this, one on top and one on the bottom. Then we have a wiper with a top contact and a bottom contact. And the mechanism that's going to first step this guy up to a quick click to a level and then rotate it so that it can connect to any one of these hundred positions. And this, this over here is going to be connected by a, a, a small wire uh, which with a wire pair uh, that's going to carry the voice current. And that, that uh, connector over here is going to be made out of tinsel wire. You know what tinsel wire is? It's, it's wire that's made by taking something like a cotton cord and wrapping it with uh, like the tinsel you used to put on Christmas trees. And the reason for doing that is you wind up with wire that's very flexible and can be flexed millions of times without breaking. So it's a very special kind of wire. So the, the basic idea is the 100 position switch, but now we have to have a way of making this guy go up and down, and that's what this giant mechanism is that you see in, 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 the, uh, in the museum. Up here, this is, the, this is the switch bank. I'll get back to that in a second. On the top, we have a bunch of relays that are just for general control of this whole thing. And in this part of the mechanism, we have three kinds of magnets. We have one magnet that lifts this rod up. So if I dial a seven, it will go click, 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 and lift the rod up seven times. And then another magnet that will rotate it. And then a third magnet which, when activated, releases everything so it just drops out and goes back to zero. Okay, so that's, that's the top mechanism, and uh, it's, it's kind of fascinating to watch it work. That's why this is a kind of an interesting demo, I think. But now on the bottom, I show not one bank of, of 100 contacts, but actually three banks. Because what we're going to do is not connect to 100 telephones at once. We're going to connect to 200 telephones at once. 100 phones over here, 100 phones over here, and then we're going to have a relay that switches the wiper from, from this one to that one. So I wind up the, with a, a 200 pole double throw switch. But I'm not done yet, because remember the old telephone cable had a tip, a ring, and a sleeve? Well, that sleeve wire is very important. It only exists within the telephone plan, and it's for superimposing a telephone pole. The way the sleeve worked originally is that when somebody went off hook, uh, it would turn on a light on the telephone switchboard, but it would also put a signal on the sleeve lead. And when the telephone operator went to plug into a jack, she would take the tip of her connector and she would first touch the sleeve of the, of the jack. And if she heard a click, there was an active signal 
which is the sleeve signal, but you know a line was busy and not to plug in there. So the sleeve circuit is, is, was, that concept was carried in the mechanical switch in another bank. Now, of course, I need a sleeve for each of these, so now I have 200 sleeve circuits here. So the sleeve circuit uh, is carried through so that this machine can know which phone is active and which phone is busy. Uh, so when we're talking about now a bank that has over 600 contacts back here, and I say over 600, because I'm going to have to have other contacts here in rest positions, in busy signals and positions, and stuff like that. We're talking about just an unbelievable number of wires and connections. Uh, all right, so how would we actually use one of these switches? The way a step-by-step -step office was designed is that uh, at the beginning of the, uh, at the front end of the central office, we actually had one of these switches that was in a sense connected in reverse. That is, 200 telephones or 100 telephones would be connected to the switch bank, and a number of these switch banks would all be connected in parallel. So this telephone would might be connected to 10 or 15 in parallel banks of switches. And when I took the telephone off hook, this device here, the line finder, would search for an active sleeve connector and then would find my telephone, and at that point it could return dial tone. So this is the electrical equivalent, if you can imagine a, a telephone operator, when the light goes on, she's going to look around, oh, there's active, I'm going to plug into that, and as soon as this guy plugs into that, I'm going to get dial tone, and now I'm also going to be connected to a first selector, which is going to be ready to take my dial pulses. So let's say I dial a seven. This guy is going to click, 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 up go seven levels, and then it's going to sweep around and find a, another second selector that's not busy. If I dial a seven, it's going to find a second selector that serves all of those telephones that have a number seven in that position. The second selector, now, which is ca now carrying that number, is going to take the second digit. It's going to, I'm going to dial a three, it's going to click up three, sweep around, find the third selector. It keeps doing that until I get to the final two digits. And then the last mach machine, it's going to actually absorb the last two digits. Go up four, around three, and connect me to telephone 43. And at that point, the phone rings. So I have my telephone connected to a bunch of line finders in the front. But this same telephone is also connected to a bunch of connectors on the other end because I also want to be able to receive calls. A lot of wires. All right, so this is, this is basically the whole, whole thing that, that, that happens over here. When I go off hook, I close a relay in the central office. And that relay is one of the few things in the central office that's actually dedicated to my telephone and nobody else. We try to minimize the number of things that are, have to be per telephone. So you offer close to the DC who pulls that relay. The first available line finder is going to find my line, return the dial tone. The next selector is going to click on dial pulses until you get to the final connector where the last two digits that are, are absorbed. It rings the phone and the person answers. That's going to trip a relay, turn off the ringing, and cut through the voice circuit. And of course, all, all of these telephones, as I said before, are connected at the other end so that you can receive a call. So we don't have all of this in the museum. That would be too much. What we do have is the line finder. You can see it finding a line. And then you can see the final connector actually connecting to the last two digits. Okay? So, um, that's basically the, uh, the thing we want to show, and uh, I guess we should just go over to the museum now and take a look at it. So, dividing two groups, is that what about the angle? Why don't you give a little background of how you got this? How did you get the Yes, we heard that a, a, apparently an old telephone guy had built this working model out in Cincinnati. His name was Steve Flocky, and uh, we, bought, we, we bought the machine from him. And uh, 
it mostly worked. We had to fix it a couple of times, and we built a demonstrator out of it. Uh, and we were really happy to get it. For years, I've, I've been wanting to show one of these things because the step-by-step -step switch is, you know, kind of an interesting gadget. Okay. So we now move over to the museum. Other end of this wire. Plug it into the person that they wanted to call, ring the phone, and get off the line, right? And if they did. Which, so which they used, usually did, but not always, right? When the phone call was finished, some lights would flash, and she would have to physically take down the, uh, the connector. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, with switchboards, where they had a lot of these in parallel, because on some switchboards, your telephone had to appear at multiple switchboards so other people <clears> could get to it. So in order to find out who was busy, she could touch, touch that and hear a click, okay? So this is the machine that's going to implement that. <coughs> okay. So I start, take a telephone off hook, and it's going to click. Let me, I'll show you that again, right? It's going to do, it, it, uh, it can, or the telephone is connected to, in this one, two different line finders. So it, Picks a, picks a busy one or the next one. Goes up and finds it, and it's going to find it by, uh, first of all, it gets a hint as to where the sleeve current is, because there's an extra commutator on the side that tells the, this guy which group it's in. So that's how it knows how far up to go before it sweeps around, okay? So it sweeps around, and now I've got dial tone. I've been connected to dial tone, and, I, and this guy is now connected to a final connector. So if I dial it a 2, it's going to come up two levels. And if I dial a 3, it's going to go around 3. And then, it's done. and then when I'm done, of course you can answer the phone if you want. And the phone disconnects everything. And this is all done completely mechanically. <laughs> so when I, you know, to, to do this in more detail, when I pick the phone up, it pulls in one of these relays, which is my line relay. You won't be able to see it unless you know exactly where to look. It pulls in the line relay. When this guy gets dial tone, it sends a signal back here, releases the line relay, pulls another relay called the cutout relay, which removes all of the other crap from the line and connects my wire pairs through to the switch. And now we're ready to, to, to do a phone call. So this time I'll dial 27, I'll dial a 2, and then a 7. Ready. Okay. Hello? Uh, you know your car warranty is about to expire. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that wasn't the way. So you can play with that a little bit if you want. Yeah, now, you know, do, so how did this get invented in 1891? Jeez. So Stroger, the guy who did this, was an undertaker. Losing and business, right? What? He, he was, was losing, losing business, business, and he didn't know why. <laughs> and it turned out that his girl, his, the local telephone operator was the girlfriend of his competitor. <laughs> and she was directing all the dead people calls to this other guy. So in anger, <laughs> he invents this thing to replace the operator. Right? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> of course, this is a, this is a, a, a later, a more modern version of the same idea. His original one was very crude. But... Uh, you know, uh, after the First World War, many, many uh, of these were installed. Now, you have to imagine that a, a, a central office with 10,000, typically they're doubled, 20,000 lines, you have to have enough, uh, uh, enough uh, line finders so that maybe as many as 10% of the people are making calls at once. So, so uh, 20,000 lines, you're going to have to have 2,000 line finders. And then you would have to have all the other stages. So you're talking about a six and eight story building with 50 or 60,000 of these switches in it, all clacking away, all operating without air conditioning, all designed for 40 year life. <laughs> and, uh, you know, in the summertime, it was really hot and noisy in these things. I remember as a kid, I was in control of the phone stuff. And my dad knew somebody who worked the phone company and got. Managed to get me into a central office. 
Yeah. I will never forget the sound. <laughs> there was not a, there was not a second. Yeah. And it was half cross bar five and uh, cross bar yeah. three and half yeah. ESS. Yeah. And with the ESS, of course. Okay, so you mentioned the cross bar. Uh, I'll, I'll mention a little bit about this. Uh, at, after the, uh, this switch was invented, people really began to get the idea that they needed automatic switching. And in fact, uh, in, I think it was early as the 20s, AT&T calculated that with their growth rate, uh, if they remained with telephone operators, it would actually take more women than existed in the United States to operate the network, <laughs> literally. So it was a necessity. And of course, you know, uh, the Bell system being what it was, always wanted to invent their own thing. And uh, so they used some of this, but they also used another kind of switch called the crossbar switch. The crossbar switch, you have to imagine a square matrix with a bunch of contacts, input and output contacts, and then bars, so that when I activate one bar and another bar, it closes that contact and stays closed. And then I can do another activation and I can make another connection at the same time. So the, the crossbar switch was very, also very widely used. But I, I believe that the last one of this type of switch lasted until 1999. Really? Yeah. Mm. yeah. Oh. But, uh, you know, world, I've been talking about, we're talking worldwide. These were used all over the world. You know? Hey, Jules. Yeah. I can imagine that they, they, obviously, they used the highest quality components in there. Yeah. But what would, what would, what would you guess maintenance would be like on something like this? We used the design stuff for 40 year life. But with all of those switches opening and closing, yes. did they have to go in and clean yes. them? Yes, we did, them? I, and, and I do that. I have the cleaners right here. <laughs> uh, it's a tiny file. And you go in there, and if you want to get crazy, that's the, that's the job. <laughs> but these the machines were designed with a tremendous amount of redundancy. Because if one of the line finders fails, it's just taken out of service, and another one will work. And if one of the final connectors doesn't work, there's another one that can take over. So it's not, uh, it doesn't have a, it has no single point of failure. I mean, there's multiple, multiple layers of redundancy. And also, it, it's designed to drop trouble tickets if something doesn't work the way it's supposed to. And people go out and fix it. But, you know, the, to me, the interesting thing is, all of this was done uh, without electronics. It was all done with mechanical switching equipment. What are you, just curious, what are you using for an interrupter? Or are you using a solid state for the, oh, what uh, for, 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 yeah, the ring interrupter? Well, just, just curious. that's a very good thing to ask because we have here a microprocessor okay. that provides uh, dial tone and ring. And now, after we had this here for a couple of months, it failed. So, what do you suppose <laughs> failed? Microprocessor, of course. <laughs> 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 yeah.